Welcome back to Krista Living Sober. I have Caroline Beadler um, on for my guest speaker today, and she is the author, speaker, and recovery advocate. I'd like to introduce yourself and let us know a little bit more about you. Sure, absolutely. Hopefully my connection is okay this morning here. It might be a little bit glitchy, but um, yeah, so I'm Caroline. Actually, pronounce my name Beidler. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, that is fine. Um, I get that all the time. I get Carolyn, too. So, you, I mean, you can call me whatever. It depends on the day. I'm kind of feeling like my identity <laughs> changes sometimes, but uh, Caroline Beidler. And, you know, I like to introduce myself. I could list a bunch of stuff that I've done, but really today, you know, I'm just feeling this connection to my identity as a woman in addiction and mental health recovery. And to me, you know, that means my life today looks so different than it did 10, 20, you know, I'm not going to tell, well, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of weeks. So 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, it's just been a really beautiful journey. I, um, you know, had been through a lot of struggle and hardship and kind of come out the other side of that. And I think, I don't know, for me, sometimes I hear like those success stories and I'm like, oh yeah, but that's, you know, that's just not me or that'd be too hard for me to get there. I mean, I feel like I do have this quote unquote success story, but at the same time, like I still struggle every day sometimes with different issues that come up, even in recovery, even in a, you know, successful recovery. And that's just life. I mean, we all have our, our issues and our different things in our stories, but I have tools today because of my recovery story and because of other things that I can get through those hard times with um, the support of others and with, you know, tools that I've learned. So I'm really grateful to be talking with you. And I just appreciate anyone who is out there visible, vocal, talking about recovery. I love it. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. It's an honor to have you. I would love to hear your story of how you became sober, if you're willing to talk about that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just kind of give you the, uh, I don't know, I say highlight, yeah. the highlight reel. Um, of course. But, basi- but basically, you know, I got started down a pretty dark path of addiction really young. Um, I think I took my first drink at 11 and really just found myself you know, searching or seeking some kind of outside thing to help me feel better and escape. And I saw that playing out in the people around me that, you know, hey, a lot of people are using alcohol. And then it became, hey, a lot of people are using other drugs. And I just started experimenting. And I, I'll be honest, you know, at first I felt this, it was like this aha moment. Oh my God, finally, you know, finally, I feel like myself, Finally, I can stand in a room or in a space with other people and not be crawling out of my skin. You know, finally, it felt like the world was making sense. I could feel okay. And, you know, that feeling okay lasted a pretty short time for me. Um, I got involved in some pretty heavy drugs pretty young. And um, so after, you know, an overdose and horrible relationships with, you know, people I should have never been hanging out with as a teenager, um, And all of these things, you know, I I was kind of propelled into addiction treatment in high school and went to inpatient a couple times. Thankfully, I had access to health insurance that was able that covered that. I know a lot of people uh, don't have that same privilege. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, instead of um, going the route where I certainly could have uh, incarceration, um, somehow miraculously, I landed in treatment. And, um, but, you know, there weren't other types of support services for me at that time. There weren't, I didn't know anything about recovery high schools. I had not heard of collegiate recovery programs or communities, uh, things that are a lot more available now for, for young people in recovery. And so I really struggled with staying sober. I was able to stay away from some of those harder drugs, but you know, the cross addiction, smoking, drinking. I mean, I just struggled off and on with staying in sobriety for you know, from 14 to 28. Um, And so, you know, it was, it was painful. And I think as women too, we don't talk enough about that's part of why on my platform, Bright Story Shine, and I have a big event coming up, I'd love to talk about too. But I'm really passionate about talking about women's recovery issues, because so many of us in our active addiction experience things that, you know, 
you know, I can speak for my own experience that I needed to work through and process because I wasn't healing even in even quitting alcohol and drugs. I mean, there was still a lot going on with me. Um, so I, re I experienced multiple instances of sexual violence. I struggled with disordered eating. You know, the list just kind of boom, 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 went on and on. And I think so many of your listeners right. can probably relate to that. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of struggle. It was a lot of hardship. But what happened to me, and it it does, it feels miraculous because I was like living this one way. And then all of a sudden it was almost this really drastic, dramatic change. And I just remember one night I was, you know, I had been sexually assaulted again. I was trying to stop drinking. I was smoking pot every day. And I just remember this moment where I literally fell to the fell to my knees to the ground. And I don't know, I mean, I wasn't faithful at that time at all, but I was just mm -hmm. like crying out to whoever was listening. And I believe now that was God, but crying out, like, help me. I need help. I need saving. I can't live like this anymore. And it was the most incredible thing. I felt God answer me at that moment. And the next day I remember waking up and I just had this message replaying in my mind. I don't know if that's ever happened to you where it's like, mm -hmm. where did this, you know, where did this come from? But it was this, this very brief phrase and it was, it's time to be alive again. And it just struck me that, wow, it is time to be alive. You know, I had survived an overdose. I had almost died how many times, you know, but it struck me that, you know, I can choose life. And it was just such a beautiful turning. And now, of course, my life wasn't like instantly better, but that was the beginning of my re mm -hmm. real recovery. I don't want to say conversion, but my recovery. No, but it was like a spiritual awakening for you. It really was. It yeah. really was. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. It took me so long to get sober, um, you know, in and out of addiction treatment centers, mm -hmm. um, dealing with the courts just a bunch of stuff from age 12 to 28 when I finally, you know, gave everything up. But I grew up around faith and then I lost it when my adopted dad died. And then I was just kind of confused about it. Similar to you, um, I kind of had like a spiritual awakening and aha moment after an episode in the hospital where I kind of had an out of body experience and I saw myself from above, like in the bed. And then I heard a voice say, it's not your time. Like it kind of like awoke me. Like I, I went back in my body and I woke up and I was like, wow, like something is speaking to me. You know, I didn't know at the time, but I think it was my higher power. I think it was God. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was enough to wow. change my life to be like, hey, I need to get sober. Like, I don't know how many more chances mm -hmm. I'm going to have. So yeah, like, I understand. Wow. And like, this time around, I put faith to my recovery. And it's it's just a huge part of my recovery journey of being sober. And, you know, I don't understand it 100% completely, you know, mm -hmm. but I know that it's a huge part of what helped me this time. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. So we, we share that too, that yeah. experience and also 28. So that's when I yeah. got mm -hmm. sober and I, I had the experience of relapsing after a couple of years and going back, but mm -hmm. 28. And let me tell you, I've spent my entire thirties. I'm going to be 40 in a couple of weeks sober, like an entire decade. And it has been the most beautiful decade. I've gone back to graduate mm -hmm. school. I've gotten married. I've had kids. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's I'm, ex been, yeah. <laughs> it's I'm expecting my first child um, next oh. month. So oh my yeah. gosh. congratulations. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, amazing things in sobriety and recovery. And I never saw that picture for myself before, you know, oh, isn't it? It's amazing how the picture we have of ourselves and our stories evolve in recovery. Cause I was the same way. I mean, I remember, you know, as like an angsty 16 year old, you know, I wear a hoodie with my hood up, you yeah. know, smoking cigarettes. I was just like, mm -hmm. I hated everyone. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't think I'd lived a 30. I mean, it was really right. this clear thought I had, I did not expect to get that, you know, that life with the husband and the kids or the partner and the kids and whatever the picture of my life has opened up. And I think dealing too with some of my, my trauma issues, and that actually didn't happen until I was 30. And thankfully, um, because I was finding myself still in these really unhealthy relationships. Um, and I don't want to get, you know, too much information here for your listeners, but it's okay. 
I was making really bad choices, mm -hmm. poor choices around my body. Me too. And, and having a, a tough time saying, I'll just say it, saying no. Um, and so it wasn't until I learned I was still stuck in this place that was really trauma symptoms and I didn't realize it. Um, and it was so freeing when I realized like, hey, there's a reason why my body kind of shuts down in these situations. There's a reason why I still don't feel like I have any control or agency around my choices. And um, I had to, I worked with a mental health therapist and she helped me through uh, this uh, addiction treatment. It's actually evidence-based, which means, mm -hmm. you know, it's been researched and people with a lot of degrees say it works. So I, I believe them, um, but it's called seeking safety. And what seeking safety taught me was just some like practical tools and things that I could learn how to treat some of my symptoms. Do you have a minute? Can I just share like an example of what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, of course. Okay. I believe like therapy is also another great, you know, thing to seek out during recovery as well, because that did work for me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, we all need different things, but at the same time, like, more support the better you know i would advocate anyone like my husband and i we actually started seeing a therapist to learn about how to communicate better just so we can like get there so anyways i recommend i just you know i love therapy. Yeah. yeah but i learned about things like you know how to regulate my body and it sounds a little like Hoo -hoo, you know but really what was happening to me and i think why i was like addicted to cigarettes and nicotine all this stuff for so long is i was trying to regulate my nervous system because when we've experienced trauma and a lot of us too in addiction, I bet a lot of things happen to me that I don't even remember, you know, um, but my body remembers and it hangs on to those things. And so, for example, I dated someone for a long time that he was, he was very tall, kind of bigger. And, you know, I would say he's, you know, I wish him the best and, you know, I still care about him, but just his physical presence sometimes would like trigger things in me where I'd get you know, my heart would start racing and I'd feel uncomfortable. I didn't know what was happening at the time, but my therapist helped walk me through, okay, in this, in these moments, we can actually do breathing exercises. We can do something called grounding where, I don't know if you've tried this, where you like picture yourself, like, okay, I feel my feet on the floor right now. You know, okay. you look around the room, like I see, you know, just grounding in the present moment actually helps us relax our bodies and i hope i'm making sense i'm kind you of are. Over i mean for me personally i've never experienced that type of therapy but i do have a friend that shared her experience with that because mm -hmm. she has super anxieties and other things going on but she was explaining how they like ground you and make you like point out things in the room and like mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting yeah it is really i mean it really is and you know just those simple things i think helped me realize too that I have the ability to start choosing healthy coping mechanism, healthy ways of taking care of myself and my body. So instead of feeling kind of trapped because this person might be like intimidating me or whatever, I can choose to, you know, stay. Well, first of all, I could choose to leave the room. Um, I could choose to go somewhere and, and ask for help around that. But I could also start focusing on, okay, maybe I need to go for a walk. Maybe my body is feeling kind of like too anxious or whatever, or I can do some breathing exercises or so as I started learning more about taking care of my physical body, dealing with some of those trauma symptoms, my mind was kind of following there. And I was able to over time, I think, and I still struggle here and there, but really relax, kind of relax and just relax into I don't want to say my body, but just like the present, you know, and just like my experience. And it was interesting. It wasn't too long after seeing that therapist, doing seeking safety, leaving the relationship. I met my husband, you know, and we have a, we have a really healthy, you know, we do, we have a really healthy relationship. I mean, it's not perfect, certainly, but we work on things. So I'm a, I'm kind of all over the place here this morning. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's fine. But that's, that's awesome seeking what is it called seeking seeking safety seeking safety i'll look mm -hmm. into that that totally makes all the sense yeah it kind of sounds like meditation or just bring awareness to yourself to your mind to your body in the present moment and mm -hmm. that yeah, heals exactly. that does so much healing for, mm -hmm. yeah exactly and i think that kind of bringing back that faith piece i think that's what god yeah. god wants us to be to have 
peace. And yeah. those are all tools that I believe God has given us to be able to get there. Yeah. Serenity. It's amazing mm -hmm. when you find yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It really is, isn't it? But it is sometimes a moment by moment journey. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy to attain for sure. Like I know when I was newly recovered, newly in my sobriety, like it was so hard for me to find that peace. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I learned how to pray. I learned how to just ask for what I can't control. And it's mm -hmm. something that I work on every single day still, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like, you know, I still deal with depression. I take medication. I deal with my anxieties. Mm -hmm. I deal with so much stuff, but I take it day by day. And I remember that God is there for me, that I'm not alone in the journey. And yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do find that peace. Yeah, so, it's beautiful, isn't yeah. it? It's, it is wonderful to know we're not alone. And we have other women, like it's so nice connecting. I feel like, yeah. you know, I don't know you really well, but at the right. same time, I feel like we have, a, you know, we have, we share a lot of our same story with each other. Yeah. And so we have, you know, the ability to connect with other women in recovery. And I think that's just, it's such a healing thing. Mm -hmm. I love how you say that, like the sharing stories does heal because, you know, I never yeah. knew my podcast would take it like, this far and like I've had so many wonderful people on sharing and you know that helps me too <laughs> I love mm -hmm. it so there is a women's recovery event coming up and it's on International Women's Day it is yes yeah. so next Tuesday March 8th yes I hope you can make it um yeah. and if you can't make the day in time you can register and get a link that will be sent out after the event but March 8th, which is International Women's Day, it's a really a historic gathering globally of women in recovery. There's a really uh, large, about 30 women gathered around a virtual table who will each be sharing a couple minutes on their own story, um, anything related to women's recovery that they'd like. There's also a breakout session later in the afternoon. So anyone who'd like to join and jump, jump in a breakout session and share is able, they're able to do that. And What's really neat is there are women all over the world. So the event's going to be translated in three languages this year, English, Spanish, and Portuguese, um, because of a large number of women coming from a couple different countries where those languages are spoken. And, you know, even in just the planning of this event, I've been meeting with so many women and it's truly incredible because we, again, we share so much of the same story, but to have a platform and a place where we can talk together about women's issues, it's going to be a really incredible event. So I hope your listeners can attend. Just go to brightstoryshine.com and I've got something that pops up on the screen there. You can enter your email and get directions on how to get the Zoom link. Okay, awesome. That sounds amazing. I love that. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm really yeah. excited about it. And so you're also passionate about women's recovery issues, focusing on like the intersection between addiction recovery and trauma. What are some of the ways that you have helped women in the recovery scene? Um, as far as like I saw, I think did you open up recovery centers or did you just help work at them? Or well, so I've been involved in developing a couple different things. Mm -hmm. So I worked. Uh, on developing a collegiate recovery program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so that was, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, my struggle in high school and college and not having access to support. Right. So I built one, I built a, a program, which is now called Badger Recovery. It's a really successful program for college students. And then I started a women's recovery home called Connect House. Okay. And um, also back in Wisconsin and uh, worked at another, you know, a couple of recovery homes. And so recovery housing is just near and dear to my heart. And one of the things I learned through my experience in creating really any recovery service that I've helped build is how important it is to incorporate the trauma resilience piece, because so many of us have those intersecting issues. And, you know, like you talked about your own mental health journey. I mean, so many of us, it's not just about quitting substances. There's so many layers to that. And so I've learned a lot about that through my program development and how important that is. So I think, you know, now I'm really passionate at this stage in my journey about just sharing stories, reducing stigma. I love what you're doing. I mean, all of it, having people share their stories, it helps others know like, hey, this is possible for me. I mean, 
when I hear, you know, if Krista tells you, you tell your story and Caroline sharing, you know, I hope someone out there can like, it hits them today, mm -hmm. the moment they're listening to this, that I can change and I can get help mm -hmm. too, because that is the reality. You know, we all can, as long as we're breathing, uh, there's an opportunity mm -hmm. to go another way and live another, you know, live the way that you know you need to be living. Uh, so I'm just passionate about telling stories. You know, I'm doing a lot of writing. Um, I'm going to have a book coming out soon. I can't say too much more about that, but um, I'm really excited about that. So, you know, just I'm all about sharing recovery stories to help reduce stigma and, you know, bringing in that faith component, bringing in that yeah. resilience component and talking about all these things that matter, especially for women in recovery. I agree so much with that. Sometimes it's hard when people get stuck in the darkness and they can't see that way out. I mean, I know I've been there, so that's what I'm trying to do, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. people can listen and watch or just get something out of my podcast, you know, people's stories that like come on and share and just know that there is hope, know that there is a light and that there's a way out and that we all can and do recover. So, yeah. And I saw on your website, I think that you have like a certain, like a, a section for faith is that mm -hmm. it's separate from like the sharing stories. Well, so on Bright Story Shine, I have what I'm calling now a virtual journal. And so I write, you know, blog posts. I invite, I would love it if you ever want to do a guest blog. Um, but I have other women who write on the blog as well. And then my personal author website, carolinebibler.com. I wanted to explore a little bit more about my own faith and recovery journey. And so I talk a little bit more on my author page about, about that specifically. Okay. Can you give some sober advice to the listeners and audience if they are sober curious, if they're still struggling in active addiction, or if they are already in recovery? What is the best thing to start doing today? Hmm. That's a really good question. I love that. And, you know, I think that it potentially can be the same answer for, for all folks, you know, whether you are still using inactive addiction, whether you're seeking recovery, whether you found it and been years in recovery. And actually was just having a conversation with a good friend about this the other day. One of the characteristics that people who are resilient have, which, you know, again, research shows. So whoever, you know, with a bunch of degrees has said, but um, I believe because it makes a lot of sense. One of the biggest, uh, the things that people who are resilient have is that they have a sense of purpose. And I love that because for my own journey and my story, I believe that, you know, starting a recovery home, helping other women in recovery, sharing my story, all of these things that I feel were wrapped up in my purpose. I don't, I don't know if I would be sober if I didn't have those opportunities yeah. to give back and to really feel like my life has value. You know, I do have a purpose. And the first time I went to addiction treatment, I had a counselor there who told me, I remember exact. I remember his, the office. I remember the way, you know, it almost that smelled. I remember the way he looked at me and he looked me in the eyes and he said, your life has value and purpose. Wow. And I just remember it was like, I had never heard that before. Mm -hmm. I had never heard someone say that, but I had also never heard that in my heart. And I heard that for the first time and it yeah. stuck with me and it still sticks with me today. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to share that with, with all of your listeners, you know, yeah. your life does have value mm -hmm. and does have purpose and whatever that means for you, maybe that means you are going to choose to make that phone call to the treatment center or reach out to your sponsor or mentor or walk through the doors of a church you haven't been in in 20 years, you know, whatever that means for you, you know, I hope that that truth can sink in to your listeners that yes, your life has value and purpose. Have you ever read The Purpose Driven Life? Mm, yeah, I yeah. have. It's a great book. That, yeah. When I was in rehab, that book helped me so much to mm -hmm. kind of um, help decipher my purpose. And it's a spiritual book, you know, in a mm -hmm. faith-based way. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, purpose is so important. And I couldn't see my purpose before. So mm -hmm. I know that's a huge reason why I wanted to escape like forever, you know, my whole life. And mm -hmm. then after finding a purpose, finding that we matter, like life-changing. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And now look at you, you know, out there helping so many people yeah. with your podcast and everything mm -hmm. else I'm sure you're doing. So that's, that's amazing. What yeah. a, what a testimony. 
Thank you. <laughs> One last question. What are you most grateful for in your life today, in your life of sobriety, recovery? Well, hands down, my beautiful children. So I was, I didn't get married till a little bit later in recovery. And then I found out I was having twins oh. and <laughs> I didn't even know I could have, you know, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, if I, I didn't think I could have kids because, you know, how unsafe I was. I'm like, I should, I should have been pregnant. Yeah. yeah, I should have been pregnant. Like, you know, I don't know how many I should have like a million kids right now. Yeah. But um, anyways, <laughs> no, I thought that. Oh yeah. My God. So then all of a sudden I get married and then six weeks later. So I have a beautiful yeah. son and daughter, Henry and Violet, and they are just the lights of my life and joy. And I've told my husband this and I pray to God regularly. I never want my children to see me in active addiction. And I want to work really hard to make sure that never happens. And I want to make sure that I can show up for them if and when they struggle with yeah. the same stuff I've struggled with. I certainly hope they won't. But anyways, they're beautiful. You can follow me, actually, Caroline Bodler official and check out some pics. I post pics of my little little ones a lot. So awesome. I will for sure. <laughs> Is your husband also in recovery with you? So actually, he's not technically in recovery, but we do not have any alcohol or substances in the home and he hasn't had a drink in a couple years. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. As long as he's supportive. That's awesome. Very supportive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for coming on my podcast. It was an honor thank to have you. you. Is there anything oh, else you'd you. like to share today with the listeners? Well, you know, I just hope folks sign up for the Women's Global Recovery Roundtable on International Women's Day, and you can check out brightstoryshine.com. And Krista, I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing out there. And you just shine like a star. And I know your life has a purpose that is so cool. You are exploring that and have found part of that. But I know you're going to help so many other people. So thank you for your what you do, too. Thank you so much for saying that it means a lot i don't want to cry yeah. congratulations again yeah. and good luck on your Thank mama you. uh, role coming up soon yeah so excited for that and i'll have to have you back on my podcast sometime to share more about the book when it comes out that would Absolutely. be awesome and anything Anytime. else you'd like just reach out okay that sounds great thank you again of course thank you so Bye. much have Bye. a great day you too. Bye.